Welcome back to another episode of Navigating the Immigration Pathways with Nava Wilson. Today, we're going to do something a little different. Um, as a law firm, the two favorite words um, lawyers have is it depends. Today, we're going to try to shift away from it depends and talk through some general profiles. And we're going to apply about a 60-40 rule. Um, based on the experience of the immigration department, and we're going to look at four standard profiles. What are typically successful uh, pathways that they could embark on um, to finding their uh, permanent residency? Um, so we'll uh, jump uh, right in with uh, Anand. Um, so Anand, uh, if I am a master's student, so I am doing a master's in uh, computer science. Um, I finished uh, my undergrad in my host country. I've moved to Canada to do a master's. Um, I am 29 years old. Uh, what are my options? How many of years of work experience you have? I have three years of work experience. Okay. So you have two options. The first would be an express entry pathway where you create a profile and apply as an applicant uh, that belongs to the STEM category. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And then the second pathway would be uh, by being an Ontario recent graduate who graduated um, within the last two years or so within two years, you can also file for a provincial nomination and expression as expression of interest uh, under the master's program. Okay. So the two options we have. Uh, is the first uh, program uh, the STEM one? Is that provincial, federal, which province? It's a federal uh, program under the expo entry. Uh, okay, great. Uh, scenario two, I am 25 years old. I finished my undergrad in my host country. I have no work experience. I've uh, come here for a postgraduate diploma. That's two years. And I um, have a PGWP. I'm just about to start my PGWP. What are um, options I should explore? It's a bit early uh, for you to ask that question. Uh, since you don't have any experience from your home country and you are a fresh graduate, you need to make a better, make a better use of your two-year PGWP. Use that time profitably to gain relevant Canadian work experience. Uh, what I meant by relevant is that it has to be under uh, the tier zero, one, two, or three. If it falls out of those tier codes, what that means is uh, that experience may not be um, beneficial. If not, there won't be a practical benefit for you when you apply for permanent residency. So the first thing that you need to do is make use, your, make use of your time um, and then start gaining Canadian work experience. And uh, upon you completing the first year, then we can consider looking at Canadian experience class, uh, also the provincial nominee counterparts like the international student stream, if you find a suitable employer and if you meet the requirements of that employer. Okay. Uh, next scenario, I am a software developer from Ireland and I've come here on a intercompany transfer. Um, what and the intercompany transfer is a, a two year work permit. Uh, I'm 30 years old. I finished my undergrad. I have five years of work experience uh, in software engineering uh, from Ireland. Uh, I speak uh, English well, write, read, um, listen. Uh, you know, I, I've got good uh, English proficiency scores. What are my options? Have you taken an English test before? I have. Uh, what was your? Uh, overall score? My overall score was uh, CLB, Canadian Language Benchmark 9, um, was my overall score. Okay. So you said uh, you graduated, uh, did you graduate from your home country? I did. Do you have an educational credential assessment obtained for the credential that you have, opt uh, you have received? What is an educational credential assessment? Good question. So an educational credential assessment would assess the Canadian equivalency of the qualification you hold. Uh, 
If you have a bachelor's degree, uh, an educational credential assessment would assess uh, in, in, in Canadian academic standards, what is the equivalency of your bachelor's degree? So okay. in, a, in a typical, uh, a typical uh, UK, if not a uh, United Kingdom, uh, bachelor's degree would translate to uh, a Canadian bachelor's degree. Okay, so let's assume in this case, I do have my ECAs. During this tenure, uh, did you work for one employer or were there multiple employers? Let's assume I've worked for employer A for two years and employer B for three years. For you, the ideal pathway would be the STEM category. By simply entering your NOC code, you, uh, you will become eligible to uh, be considered as a STEM category applicant. Um, as a software developer slash software engineer. And the most recent draw had a CRS score of 484, if I'm correct. And you would effectively meet the, that score by having a bachelor's degree and uh, by having a CLB9, because we had a similar client uh, for whom um, we, have, uh, we did the PR application and now she's waiting for her ITA. She was a software developer from her home country, but the only difference is that she had some Canadian credentials as opposed to you having, do you have Canadian work I'm experience? I'm here on a, um, a um, uh, uh, intercompany transfer, so I'm now six months into my two-year yes. work permit. So uh, the main differentiator between you and her is like you have Canadian work experience, whereas she had Canadian credentials. So you would uh, effectively meet the required score and you have a higher chance of getting your ITA invitation to apply. Got it. So I, I have, uh, if I understand correctly, there's two potential paths here. One is through the STEM category, and then the other is through uh, Canadian experience class, assuming there's yes. a draw for Yes, since you have more than uh, one year experience in Canada, you would also okay. become eligible as a Canadian experience class applicant. But in your case, uh, you have more chances under the STEM category. Okay. Great. Um, now let's assume I'm 45 years old. Um, I was a VP of uh, some company in my host country. I have managed 200 people in my team, uh, highly credentialed um, in this scenario. Let's assume I did a bachelor's uh, I did, let's say I, I assumed, let's assume, yeah, let's assume I've done a bachelor's and I've had a very successful career. Um, I want to look at my PR options. Um, I do well, let's say CLB9. Um, I'm 45, good work experience, uh, bachelor's degree. Do I have a chance? You seem to have a very uh, impressive track record, but unfortunately, age is, a, age is one of the uh, factors they heavily consider. You may not have a direct uh, pathway here because age, uh, in terms of age, you have a major disadvantage. But however, if you have a Canadian employer who's willing to hire you on LMI, since you are a, uh, you, your occupation belongs to, uh, pot, possi would possibly belong to a tier double zero category, if an LMI application, uh, if you get a positive LMI outcome, you would receive 200 points on top of your CRS scores. So assuming you would be at a CRS score of 325 to 350 at the moment, should you receive an LMI of a letter from an employer, then by having that offer letter, you would receive 200 points in extra. And that in has combination, to be, um, what kind of role here? It has to be a C-level executive role, like a chief technology officer, oh. um, a, a CEO, CTO, because right. you said you have yeah. a, 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 the same caliber of experience in your home country. Right. So, yes. Now, let's go through that same scenario again. I'm 45 years old, same credentials, same work experience. I also have a PhD. Does that make a difference? Uh, not as much. Okay. But uh, if you gain a PhD in Ontario, there's a specific program targeted at people with PhDs. Okay. That does not have age as a barrier. Okay. But for that, uh, that would suit someone who's into academics. Okay. Uh, a scholar. 
Got For it. them, that's a separate program. And is that only PhD? Is that PhD and master's? Only, I mean, the assumption is that you need to have a PhD, master's to do PhD. So right. the master's could be from any country. Yeah. For example, say now um, a scholar from country A would like to come here and pursue master's at York University. If they graduate, then by graduating with a master's at an Ontario university, they become eligible to apply under this stream, which does not have age as a barrier. Okay, so if I'm 40, 45 years old, and I could get into a master's or provincial program at an Ontario university, that could help me overcome the right. age barrier. Okay. And uh, quite interestingly, uh, we did a consultation, our firm did a consultation for one of uh, one of the one of our clients who was in his late thirties, but uh, he's a UK citizen. Uh, he also had a business here in Canada, so the the partners of the business wanted to bring him on a permanent residency, obviously due to the practical benefits attached to having a PR here and being a director in Canada. Then they were looking at his CRS scores. It was like as low as uh, three hundred and sixty or, or or a higher three hundred. Then they reached out to us asking for a suitable um, solution or a pathway. Then we recommended, even though he is one of the directors, we recommended other directors to uh, do an LMIA and hire himself, hire him as an employee, as a CTO uh, for the Canadian counterpart of their business because it was a global business. And it turns out they done that, and now he ha he received his ITA to apply uh, in the mid of last year. Okay, so if you're if you have a company and you're expanding globally, in those cases you can hire effectively through the director, hire yourself as an executive for the expansion. Yeah, there are a few things. There has to be a pre-existing Canadian company. Okay, and there and if it's Intra-company transfer is different. That's what I think you meant, where you have global uh, companies, I mean, which have direct nexus between each other in terms of profits. There has to be uh, some value chain activities makes both the companies in de uh, dependent on each other. Mm -hmm. But for the purpose of um, um, an LMIA, it's, it's not required. But this was a this was a this was an isolated scenario. If we have a have a business here, I mean, I don't have to be a director. I may be somewhere. But if the business is willing to hire you uh, as a uh, uh, for a position that's that belongs to tier double zero, then you can effectively get two hundred points out of it. Okay. But in his case, he happens to be. He also happens to be the director of the business, but he had that avenue to pursue because that that was there was a board that governed the business and the board made a decision to do an LMI and bring him here. Okay, so um, Anand, what I'm uh, I'm going to summarize what I've heard. Uh, if I've misunderstood anything, please let me know. So, generally, Canada is looking for young, educated people who communicate in French or English well and have um, some work experience. There are specified paths and filters applied on some of the priorities Canada is trying to address. So as an example, it's trying to attract more educated people. So there are specialized um, programs for people with masters and um, PhDs. It's trying to retain people that already have Canadian experience um, and have found a, a way to contribute to the Canadian economy. So it's looking at retaining these people with Canadian experience. Um, and then um, there are specific in-demand occupations and there'll be pathways there. And the um, uh, and beyond that, it's it's generally kind of those four core competency that Canada is is looking at. That's correct. Great. Thank you so much for joining us again. If there are other profiles that you're interested in uh, us providing some high level feedback on, please leave those in the comments. For uh, a deeper dive, you can join one of our educational seminars or webinars. 
uh, the seminars are in person at our office, the webinars we do online, um, or you can um, uh, meet us for a one-to-one -one consultation. Thank you again for joining us today.